Hey, good evening, and welcome to another edition of Montpelier Civic Forum. No, it is not February, and no, we don't have town meeting coming up, and we don't have candidates running for office. We have a former candidate, but we don't have candidates running for office. What we do have is an extraordinary circumstance, an extraordinary time in our town. And we have a series of these that are special. And they're, they're a great series. You really should watch them all. Uh, we have Bill Fraser talking about the hit that the city budget took and talking about city services, how they're being delivered, how he believes that our town will reopen. And we even have a section on policing in that, that that's really worth watching. Uh, we also have Libby and Jim from the Montpelier Roxbury School. We have our superintendent and we have our board president. They're going to talk about what happened in the spring. They're going to talk about the graduation that wasn't, but what it was and it wasn't. And they're going to talk most importantly about what the plans are as they evolve towards the fall. That's a, that is a really good show. Uh, we have Carolyn Brennan, uh, who's the director of the library service, co-director actually, of our Kellogg Hubbard Library. And she comes in and talks to us about the Kellogg Hubbard that is and the Kellogg Hubbard that's evolving as they try and figure out how to open. Uh, we also have the two police chiefs, Chief Fakos and Chief Pete, which is going to be an excellent show. It is an excellent show, actually, where we frame what their vision of community policing, which is 21st century policing, what that means, what is happening in Montpelier today, and what the vision is to where it will evolve. That is an excellent show. Uh, John Odom is coming in to talk about elections, to talk about what he thinks is going to happen in August and what he'd like to see happen in November. He'll probably end up, I haven't filmed that one, he'll probably end up begging for election helpers. We'll see. I also have Ann Watson, our mayor. And Ann has been on this numerous times, not only as mayor, but as city council person. And a long time ago, she was candidate Ann Watson, yes? Yes, yeah, and here we are. And I've been the mayor now, gosh, this is going into my third year. Uh, we last spoke in February, and that was a long show, and we covered a lot of territory. Was there anything we left out? At that last show? Yes. My goodness, that was a long time ago. But of course, at that point, who could have anticipated that we would be dealing with a, pan a global pandemic? and uh, Which um, hit less than a month after you and I were here yes, in the yeah, studio right. with our show. Shortly after town meeting day, that is when everything started to close. And, and in addition, um, you know, here we are also in a long overdue reckoning about racial justice. And so big But we big discussed topics. that. Actually, we did discuss that during the show in February. That's not something that simply now. That's fair. That's fair. We discussed it, in fact, because as people who watch this show know, you are our town's physics teacher. Yes. And you teach every time that you go into that school, you pass the Black Lives Matter flag. That's right. Yes. The, the, that was a, an initiative uh, a couple years ago uh, by really a group of students uh, to uh, have a, a symbol that uh, felt that they felt represented them. And uh, we were the first in the country uh, to have a school raise a Black Lives Matter flag. And we've been fairly keenly aware of that issue. We have commission, we have a, a panel that works on that, don't we? Uh, a racial justice. So the school has a um, a racial justice alliance club, and the city has um, a social and economic justice committee. Uh, we recently uh, gave them some money to uh, contract out some services to do uh, basically an assessment of how we're doing as a city. Now that is not a reason for the rest of us to uh, depend on them to to do the thinking around. Uh, issues of justice in our community. I think it's everyone's responsibility to be having those, um, those conversations and di difficult conversations even. Now, at the same time, uh, we'll head over to uh, our police chiefs. Sure. Uh, you were involved in the process of hiring a new police chief. I was actually not involved. So I was not on the hiring committee. Um, there were other members of uh, the public that were on the hiring committees. Uh, or part of the groups that uh, that were involved in hiring, as well as um, I know some of the staff got to um, 
meet the candidates ahead of time and, and uh, vet them as well. Uh, but that, that was not me and it was but not council, the council. Council did set out kind of uh, the overall spec, the overall job specification that pointed towards the type of chief that we were looking for. Well, I think it was pretty clear that we wanted a chief who was in line with our values. What as are a our community. values in terms of policing? Well, I, I think it's I think it's pretty um, uh, clear coming from, especially from the, the our current uh, soon to be uh, retired chief, uh, that one of the well. So speaking generally, um, I think we have a high value on. Uh, treating everyone fairly, doing our best to serve um, and, and protect uh, vul particularly vulnerable populations um, and taking a sort of a whole person approach and a compassionate approach to policing. Uh, that I, I think resonates with our community. And a lot of that is embodied in something called uh, the Presence Report on 21st Century Policing, which outlines some best practices for policing that that really do uh, embody a sense of compassion uh, and fairness for all people. How does that compare to community-based policing? It well, it's related. Um, and I mean, community p policing can mean a lot of different things. Uh, and we're gonna, as a city, we're going to be having more conversations about policing on into the future uh, as, as we get to know our new chief and as we get to um, having these hard conversations around race, but I also think um, you know we want to take a look at what our data says and what how, how um, like basically where is Montpelier's growth edge, um, and actually you know to um, to our uh, to Tony Fakus's credit and uh, to the uh, the staff's credit, we've all we really have already started having those conversations. I mean, this coming fiscal year. The police are hiring a um, uh, social worker to be a part of the department, which I, I think is very that's shared with Barry, right? Shared with Barry, yes, which is really progressive. Like that's a, sort of a different approach. It's not normal for uh, police departments to have social workers um, embedded right in the department. And in addition to that, in the last uh, in, in the FY twenty one budget, we also hired, uh, or there's money to hire. Uh, a street outreach person to particularly work with our uh, unsheltered population to try to help get them the resources that they need. And that, that's separate from the police department. Um, but that was intentional because, uh, you know, some folks that are living out on the street might be wary of someone who they felt like was associated with the police department. Um, and that that's fine. Um, so, but this person is is really there to just you know, keep in touch with that community and help connect them to resources and um, opportunities. So, uh, really grateful for the council's willingness to be uh, creative and um, think outside the box on those things. And and I think that that is going to continue. Um, and and we're going to take an, you know some honest look at our own data. Well, when the chief posted on Facebook his introductory post. Uh, he mentioned not only uh, minorities, mm -hmm. and he mentioned uh, uh, LGBTQ. Uh, I, I always mess that up. <laughs> I'm an old guy. Uh, but he also mentioned uh, people with mental health issues. Mm -hmm. Yes. Could, could you elaborate on that a little bit? Because the two shootings that we had that involved right. police right. both involved people with mental health issues. Sure. Well, so there's, there's a lot to be said about that. Um, the, one, of the, one of the difficulties um, around mental health issues is that it's not always apparent. Uh, you know, a lot of times uh, if there's a you know, person of color, a lot of times that is apparent. And uh, you know, we, we, we do um, keep track of our racial profiling data uh, for the city. But again, you know, we're not, we're not asking people necessarily to disclose if they have mental health issues, um, but it, it may not be clear right away um, when a police officer walks into a, a tense or difficult situation if that's what's going on. Um, now, this is one of the reasons why we hired a social worker to be uh, a part of uh, the department, um, but, uh, but, you know, sometimes when it's, you know, three in the morning, 
uh, that social worker is not necessarily um, on call or on duty. Uh, and well, the so, shooting on the bridge over at the yeah. roundabout was five. So there weren't even social service agencies right, open. Right, right. That's and so it it really is a tough situation. But at that same at the same time, our police do have trainings around mental health. Uh, so, you know, all that is to say, you know, our staff is was working hard, trying to be, uh, you know, as as uh, proactive as possible around those types of issues and you know we're always open to to suggestions and doing better if there's if there's better ways of doing things so you know it's an ongoing conversation and, and we'll, we'll see how it evolves when you hear people say defund the police mm -hmm. what goes through your mind as a mayor and as an experienced city, city council person sure, before that? sure sure so when I hear that um, a lot of times, well, first, I, I would say I start thinking, what does that phrase mean to that person? And why, why are they saying that? Like, where, what are they, where are they coming from uh, on that? And I, I feel like part of my job as mayor is to listen honestly to everyone and recognize that um, people have lots of different backgrounds uh, from which they may be saying those things. Uh, and... And to be fair, you know, a lot of that, um, you know, I have to process as like, uh, you know, is, is there an opportunity to defund the police? Is what is the cost of, of doing that? Because there are, I think there are hidden benefits, well, perhaps hidden benefits, but also hidden costs to that. And I think there's also, um, uh, there's, there's just, there's a lot to process uh, around that. And I, I think we're going to, that conversation will take a long time, and that's okay. In a sense, defunding is a zero. In, in, in one sense, it's a zero-sum game. If you add something, you take away from the police department to add that. When people speak of defunding, aren't they speaking of, of rerouting towards people like a social worker and, a, and a, um, a person to go out on the street? Aren't we, in essence, offering those services that the defund police people are desiring? Yeah, I mean, I think sometimes people don't always know that we've done that. Um, is there a more opportunity to do that kind of thing? Possibly. Uh, so even if we are doing well, is there opportunity to do better? Sure. Um, I think it's also um, important to understand the national narrative around that as well, because um, in Vermont in particular, we, uh, our social services, generally speaking, are provided for through the state and municipalities, generally speaking, don't provide the, the kind of social services that um, <laughs> might be embedded in, say, you know, a town like Los Angeles or Portland, Oregon, um, where they're big enough that they do have their own uh, set of social services or, or even like Burlington um, necessarily. Now that's not to say that we couldn't do uh, something, but uh, but we we do we we are already going down that path. Again, could we do better? Quite possibly. Um, anyway, open to that conversation. Um, reshaping the place and, and adding in the show that Bill did, which is an excellent show, and you should watch it. And it's on Orca, the Orca channel on YouTube. Um, he spoke of a city budget that's been devastated. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about the city budget? Oh, sure. So when we uh, first saw that everything was closing, and, and maybe Bill has covered this already, but... It makes no difference. You have to assume okay. that people haven't watched okay, that show. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, as everything was starting to close, and we realized that we were going to uh, have a shortfall of revenue... Uh, the initial estimates were that we were going to be looking at about half a million dollars for just the last quarter, what what for us is the last quarter of With this With the major year. portion of that being the parking. Um, parking is a little funny. It's free right now. It's, well, it's free, free right now, months. yes. Uh, but there were other losses of revenue, uh, particularly with uh, programs not happening with the rec department uh, or the senior center. Um, that that kind of thing and um, local uh, options tax exactly that that's really the big the big one was that with with uh, restaurants and bars closing we were not going to see the meals rooms and alcohol uh, tax and as well as hotels closing uh, as well 
So with that shortfall of revenue, we, of half a million dollars, we knew there was, we were going to need to take some drastic um, action to come out basically even, um, or to, to make that up. And so as a result, we uh, asked the staff to take voluntary furloughs. And a lot of that was, um, well, so people, people did volunteer. It was about a quarter of our staff uh, that, that ended up uh, taking that option. And now they're coming back soon. Well, this, yes, uh, they are. And they, it, it's not clear that everyone's going to be starting on the same day. I don't think, I think people, in fact, will not be starting all together on J July 1st or whatever. Uh, but we're going to sort of phase into getting everybody back. Uh, but it also depends on how things continue. Now, with the furloughs that just happened, uh, it turns out that we were able to basically break even for this um, FY20 uh, this current fiscal year, which ends at the end of this month, which is very soon. Uh, for, as things unfold with FY21, starting July 1st. FY being fiscal year. Yes, F, yes, thank you, fiscal year uh, 21. We are just going to have to see how it unfolds. Now, at our last two council meetings, really, uh, we looked at basically a triage budget. So, uh, if things continue to... In a triage situation, someone dies. <laughs> well, well, one hopes not, right? <laughs> so, uh, but it's, it's sort of like thinking about what would we do if, if the revenue continues to not come in uh, or continues to be less than we had anticipated. Well, it's going when, to be less. It's going, it? to, it's going to be less. The question is really how much less. And so we approved a... Um, uh, a budget that does have some cuts to it. And ideally the situation turns out to be better than we expect. And we're, we'll, a, we'll be able to roll back in um, some of those cuts that we made. The federal money that came, the billion dollars that they're discussing on the state level, yep. is any of that coming to the municipalities? My understanding right now is generally speaking that it is not. Oh, that's yeah. brutal. Yes, yes. Um, and we'll see how things progress at the federal level, that um, there were some, some glimmers of hope there, but I'm not sure that, that now, that's going to make it through. For those of you who watch the Bill show, you get a much more complete explanation yes. of what I'm going to say. <laughs> but there's a state program called PILOT, which is payment in lieu of taxation for all those government buildings that we have in town. And the, the problems that we're having with Pilot is that it's funded by the local options tax of not only our town, but of a number of towns, so that we won't possibly get the degree of Pilot funds that we thought we would get. Yep. Bill says it yep. much better than I. Well, yeah, right, exactly. And uh, especially as a lot of our businesses are still, particularly you know, bars and restaurants are still only starting to open, so many of them are still not open, uh, that, will, that will also continue to affect our revenue. So what did that budget look like? That It's, it's a preliminary budget, I take it. Y well, yes. Uh, and I was really glad that uh, we were not in a position where we would be going back to voters and saying, actually, we need more money. That is very much... The, uh, we, we really want to avoid doing that. That is, that is uh, we're, we're definitely looking at cuts before we look at, go, you know, going back. Are we um, going to voters for a new recreation center? <laughs> so a little sh shift of topic there, but... Uh, the, it's the same topic of coming to... I, I see what you're saying. Um, the current recreation building that's on Barry Street needs significant work. Uh, at one point back in March, really, we were talking about having a bond to do... In the, August. Possibly. Oh, as soon as August, possibly in November, because uh, those would be the two, you know, the August one is along with the primaries and the November one is along with the general election. Um, it is looking like we are not going to do that. We are, I don't think anybody is in a financial place where they're ready to think about um, uh, taking, taking, on on, new debt. taking on new debt, taking on a, a new project uh, that would potentially be in the millions of dollars. So, um, so that's pushed off. Yes. And this preliminary budget that we approved, uh, a lot of, I mean, they, they were, the staff was really looking for big ticket items, you know, that could make substantial 
changes. So we're deferring purchase of capital equipment. Yes, capital equipment and uh, projects, uh, which it really does affect the maintenance plan that we had been on. We we worked many years to for street maintenance for street maintenance. The we, potholes exactly. We worked really hard to um, get back to a level of funding where we would be. Uh, funding our streets and sidewalks at a sustainable level. Like this is what it would take to maintain uh, all of our streets and have them be a, an acceptable uh, pavement condition uh, index, <laughs> PCI. So it's where all we, we have to do at that, in theory, it just becomes routine maintenance after we've invested. Exactly. Right. Once we've gotten everything up to a certain level, then then you can sort of, it's easier to, it's cheaper even to maintain things at a, when they're at, at a, a high quality uh, already. And we've skipped a cycle? Well, that's, so for some parts of uh, Montpelier, yes, we will be a little bit behind. We'll be a year behind in that maintenance um, schedule. So, you know, that, that means that it's possible that at some future year, one hopes that, you know, we will have recovered and things will be, you know, healthy again and, and we'll be able to make up that difference. But we are uh, in a, basically in a gap right now. Were there any other major capital projects we put off? Uh, well, nothing specific comes to mind right now. Je I mean, it was generally... Um, the big one. The, yeah, yeah. Paving and uh, you know that kind of maintenance as well as um, equipment purchases. Were there any other initiatives that the city was going to take that were delaying? Uh, well, so we we did end up I think um, taking some funding from the Montpelier Development Corporation, but that's you know all part of the discussion even for next year. So we'll see. Now let, let's talk about something more hopeful. Okay. <laughs> um, our transit plans. Yes. Uh, we discussed that at some length in February as a, geez, I hope that this were to happen. Yeah. Could you update us on that? Sure. Well, I, if I recall, we talked about microtransit. Exactly. Uh, back then. Um, I, so that's a, an initiative of uh, a committee of people, and I, I know the uh, Sustainable Montpelier Coalition is a part of that group, and I don't know where they're at with that. I think they were hoping to be rolling out uh, an initial uh, trial, a pilot of... But they got funded. Uh, but yes, it, but it did get funded, but I don't know what their timeline is now. Um, they were hoping to be starting it this summer, but I think, it's, I think everything's sort of been delayed. Now, this is simply, at this point in this show, this is insider language. How would this differ from the circulator? Sure. So, microtransit is very much like Uber if you're or, or Lyft, if you're familiar with those technologies, but it would be uh, more uh, publicly funded, uh, ideally cheaper, I, I believe, and, uh, and also accessible. Uh, so there would be, let's say, um, uh, what would be, basically how it would work is that you would log into the app and say, I am here and I want to go there. And then one of the van drivers would come to pick you up and might um, it might pick up uh, a few other people along the way, so it's a, it's actually a little bit more like uh, a shared Uber or a, a shared Lyft, as that van. So you won't have ghost buses driving around with no one in them. Well, r right. Well, it, there could still be um, times when it's not used, or times when there is still just one person in it. Uh, but but it all depends on the uptake of, of that technology, like how many people actually use it to get to work or to get to. Uh, you know, practice or to wh wherever they need to go. Uh, and I believe they were looking at trips specifically that started and ended within Montpelier, uh, which theoretically, I mean, that's, that should be the kinds of uh, commutes that are easy to, to transition to that kind of uh, system. So we'll see how it goes and should be, uh, should be fairly flexible in terms of people actually coming to where you are um, so we'll see how it goes. So in theory, and this is wildly in theory, uh, those people who work downtown and take up parking spaces while they're working downtown wouldn't be taking up parking spaces and it would free more parking spaces Quite possibly, quite possibly. One would hope. <laughs> or it might lead to remote lots and the ability for people to park at a remote lot 
and get into downtown. Sure, that they could do that. Or uh, if we do ever build a parking garage, um, that means that we could centralize the parking in downtown and free up other spaces in our downtown for other uses. What, uh, what is the status of the hotel and the parking garage? Is the hotel still on? Um, as, uh, as far as I know, we are all still moving forward uh, in hopes that that project does still happen. It is uh, currently still in litigation. And Welcome to Mount Failure. Yeah, <laughs> right. And so we'll, we'll see how, how it turns out. Uh, design review. Can we talk about two? Like we're in the happy section of this yeah. before we go back into the pandemic. Sure. Uh, that corner um, where our restaurant is across from the pavilion, we have a building going there. Yes. Do you mean in front of Faux Capital? Exactly. Yes. Right. Right on that corner. Um, so, yeah. So uh, there's a developer that has put forward a... A developer. A developer. A developer. Uh, sorry, Tom, Tom Lozon. Um, Who was your peer in Barrie for a while? Yes, this is true. Former mayor of Barrie. Uh, so he uh, has put forward a uh, uh, building uh, design for that lot. Three stories? Uh, I, I believe so. And th uh, the hope is that there would be like a bank that would go into, into that. I know they were um, at one point considering it as a drive-through bank. And I, I don't know where that stands necessarily at this point, but uh, that's it's under, under review currently, I think. But that corner will be developed again. Yes. yes. Will the ugly <laughs> frame of the sign that was disappear? Well, I, once that construction happens, I imagine it will, yes, disappear. <laughs> That's good news. Yes, I, I agree. <laughs> for those of us who've been in the town for a while, Grossman's? Grossman's Lot, yes. Yeah, so Where those, is Grossman's Lot? Yes, yeah, so I was going to say, for those who aren't familiar, uh, that is the building that is next to the roundabout with 302, sort of uh, going towards... Uh, over, over by the auto dealership. Yes, by the... Yes, exactly. The Ford dealership. And uh, it's sort of a cream and salmon striped building. Uh, and uh, that, so that property, uh, I believe, has... Uh, I believe it's been purchased, and there's some plans for um, what that, that property may look like. And I know that site had been relatively contaminated, uh, and uh, I, I believe also that they've been doing quite a bit of cleanup work uh, on that, which I think is a, a real win for the environment there and the health of the Winooski, which is uh, very encouraging. And we picked up a restaurant that will sell Indian food downtown? I, I'm pretty delighted about that. We haven't had an, an Indian restaurant in Montpelier, and it's as far as back as I can remember, and so that is wonderful, wonderful addition. Anything else? Uh, oh, what, what's going on with that house uh, over in that neighborhood? Oh, by the roundabout there? Exactly. Okay, yeah, so that is um, a, been a, a topic of council discussion for some time now. Uh, that building came to our attention as potentially being a nuisance building uh, in that it was... Uh, a hazard to the public that it also had a historical value didn't it yes so that property was the site apparently of the first resident of Montpelier uh, it's, it's associated with the founding of Montpelier however the house that is there was not that man's or that family's house it was not it was not his house um, that was built later now to be fair it is um, still a very historic house and there is a historic uh, preservation easement on on the house. Uh, now it's a, it's a very long it's a long story, uh, but basically where we're at now is that the city has declared that it is a, a nuisance building, and as a result, we boarded it up um, to prevent people from wandering into it, as it was unsafe, or you know from uh, animals getting in that that sort of thing. Uh, but the future of that property is still under debate. And as we are, are trying to untangle what's going to happen with that property, um, it, it's, still, it's still not super clear. Well, so what the city has said, and we actually only just said this last night, uh, was that the city is going to do periodic uh, safety assessments, building inspections of that building to ensure that it's not imminently going to collapse. Uh, and 
th that is going to continue to be our role. Who owns it? Well, that's the question. Who owns it, right? Like that, that question is actually the, the, you know, the million dollar question. Uh, but just to, to finish this other thought, uh, we're going to continue to make sure that it is not an imminent threat, um, a safety hazard to the public, while parties work out the question of who owns it. And so, because really what that means is who is responsible for shoring up the building, for bringing it back to its uh, once former glory. Or demolish it. Or demolish it. Like, who's, who's even responsible for doing that? Um, it's possible that if it gets to be such a derelict state that it is eminently going to fall down, we, as the city, do have the right to go demolish the building. But uh, it's, but again, it is, it's messy, uh, legally. So uh, one of the things that, that we would like as a council, uh, we, we took a sort of a straw poll on this last night. Um, there are sort of two sections to that property. There's the back acreage that goes along uh, the Stevens branch uh, of the Winooski. It's, it's sort of, it's a lovely uh, spot back there. Um, it's got a scenic view of the gas of, station. And, and well, <laughs> well, actually, it, it doesn't really. Do you mean like the, the Grossman's lot? Yeah, no, you can't really, well, I guess you probably could. It's, it's a little, from the building, you could probably see it. But there's a whole back section of acreage that uh, I think the city is uh, potentially interested in acquiring. And whether that is a, you know, a park or used for agriculture or used as a dog park or all three or you know, some other use, we, I think it could serve some city interests. That property is also difficult because it's in the floodway. So there's very little that you can do with it anyway. Uh, but what happens to the building is more complicated. So we'll see. I think it's going to be yet to be told over some time. I'll revisit our discussion in February. Uh, District 3, we had two seats in District 3. Yes. And we had discussion of a park in District 3, a possible area that could conceivably be leveraged city property for a park. Any movement on that? Um, are you referring to like the Stonewall Meadows? Exactly. Yes. Uh, so uh, I, I I think that is a property that we are still in. Well, so the we city, own part of I was going to say, the city owns um, part of that property. And I think it is still on our radar as a property that we would like to develop into a park. But again, with With COVID, all that we've got with, on our plate. Exactly. Right with all that's going on right now and our staff being largely yeah. furloughed, um, that has been very but much But it hasn't, the it hasn't disappeared for those people in, on District 3. Yes, no, absolutely. And I, I think it would be. A, wonderful addition uh, to the parks in the city. And so that, that is still on our radar. And I, I hope that that's something we can see some more movement on in the coming years. Our park staff is starting to return from furlough, some yes. of it. What's your view on, on what's going on with Hubbard Park? In what way? What do you mean? Is it open, fully open? Uh, is Hubbard Park fully open? Yeah. Uh, well, yes, I would say so. The shelter houses, can you... You know. Yeah, so uh, people can, uh, uh, my understanding is that um, people are going to be able to start reserving uh, those spaces soon. And um, yeah, so that, that should be returning to normal. Uh, now, the, some of the mowing and the upkeep are, are slow, but um, yeah, that's, that's sort of where we're at. In terms of... of um we're heading back downtown on the um, on the trail on the, the walking trail, the bike trail. Sure. Popular? People oh my using goodness! It? Yes, the Sibawinabi Path. Uh, that's the official name of the the uh, shared use path through Montpelier. That what, has, what is the name? Uh, Sibawinabi. That is. Um, I'm glad that you say it, and I don't have yeah, to. <laughs> yeah, uh, I believe that's an Abenaki uh, phrase for uh, I think it's river water. Um, yeah, as it follows right along the Winooski River. So that has been wildly popular uh, through, uh, especially through uh, the closures due to COVID. Uh, it's been really wonderful to see people out. And, you know, there's been various uh, reports of people either wearing masks or staying socially distanced. And I would certainly encourage people to stay 
distance. Oh, by the way, both of us are 10 feet apart. Yes, exactly. We're <laughs> unusually far apart for one of these interviews. Uh, but I would certainly encourage folks to continue to stay six feet away um, from ev everyone else as they are uh, passing people on the on the shared use path or as they're you know coming across other other folks going the other direction and also as you can please do continue to to wear masks we're going west on Barry Street okay to the senior center yep open uh, a lot of those that programming is well actually not a lot uh, that programming is still closed and even though the the governor has recently had some uh, advice as to how senior centers can uh, reopen our senior center continues to be closed and we're going to phase into opening slowly over time so but no no movement on that yet let's cross the street the recreation center uh same same still still closed the camp the recreation center camp i believe they're going to try and make that happen Do you, oh you mean for for kids yeah yes uh we are ho uh, hosting camps uh, for the summer, and you can look for the sign-up uh, uh, availability for that on the internet, on the city's website. Let's cross the parking lot to the pool. Okay. The pool is closed. The pool is closed for the summer. Yeah, we made that decision. Well, the, the staff and the city approved it, um, gosh, uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, I know that's a, a real bummer for a lot of folks that the pool is closed, but it's just a a matter of safety for everyone as well as our furloughed staff uh, situation. And so I, I see that as an opportunity for folks to explore other places potentially, so Wrightsville Reservoir, uh, but there's also some great swimming that I, um, you know, part of you, it, it's nice that like not a lot of people know about this, but I think it's underused. Uh, there's some great swimming down at the Dog River Fields. Uh, there's a, a bend in the Dog River there, and uh, there's a beach. Um, well, that fun is now gone, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it should be more used than it is. And I know some, some folks may be sad that I'm saying it because it's like, oh, it's like a cool secret little place. But, uh, you know. Round I, I, Rock. What's that? Round Rock. Round Rock, yeah, or Big Rock. Or Big Rock, Yeah, I yeah, uh, that's also a great spot to go swimming. So there, there are other opportunities. And, you know, if all else fails, hopefully you can, you know, connect a hose up to a sprinkler and, and jump through that. Uh, you're not going to be uh, marching in the parade on July 3rd. Because there is no parade on July 3rd. Dan Groberg talked yeah. about the sad time for him to have to inform not only a community, but all the vendors and all the people who participated yeah. in the parade. Yeah, yeah. But we did have a, a Juneteenth celebration uh, recently. Just this Green Up happened. And Green Up Day happened, yep. Uh, that was, uh, I'm so glad that uh, some of these uh, events are emerging and, and also continuing to happen. On Dan Groberg's show, which is also well worth watching, and it's on the YouTube channel, uh, the brown bags are coming back. He's having uh, not as many, but Montpelier Live will be sponsoring the brown bag concerts. Great, great. Talk Excellent. to me about Langdon Street. That's a great question. Last night at our council meeting, the, the city council approved a plan to change some things around on Langdon Street. So we had heard some calls to close Langdon Street entirely. Uh, that proved to be pretty complicated. Uh, there is a, a parking lot True. off be, behind uh, Three Penny, and there is a, a parking lot off um, to the on the left hand side across from Onion River Outdoors and people need to continue to have access to those spaces so fair enough so we we then considered uh, what if we were just to close uh, half of it you know from those parking lots on uh, and turn the remainder of Langdon Street into two, a two-way traffic kind of situation um, that turned out to also be difficult in terms of is everything turning difficult radius, in this radiuses. town? <laughs> Well, we like to be careful, right? Like we like to do, be thorough, and that's you know that's okay. Uh, but the, the closing Langdon Street really was going to be of substantial benefit to two restaurants on Langdon Street: the Langdon Street Tavern as well as Sweet Melissa's. So, with that in mind, we came up with a plan that leaves uh, one lane of traffic. Well, it is one lane. So let me back up. Basically, the plan that we approved eliminates all of the parking uh, on Langdon Street from those 
two parking lots on and allows the uh, Line Street Tavern as well as Sweet Melissa's to set up tables uh, out in the street, basically. But with all of the, the parking gone for that half of the street, uh, we're able to keep a one lane of traffic open so that people will continue to be able to use it as a one-way street. And we'll fire still... vehicles can go through. Well, I'm sorry? And fire vehicles. And fi exactly. Safety vehicles will still, that was a must. Uh, safety vehicles will still be able to make it through. Uh, and it will still be a one-way street. And so the, the functionality basically of the street is, is still maintained, uh, less the parking. But it also is going to be providing a, this benefit to um, a couple of businesses that I think can, can really use it. So there's that plus, especially right now, while parking is free in the downtown, uh, people should theoretically, hopefully, be able to find parking elsewhere. Um, you're also dealing with parking spaces on other streets downtown besides Langdon. You're yes. offering the merchants a chance to... Uh, Yes, yeah, so avail themselves of that exactly, especially as one of our focuses through uh, uh, managing the the impact of closures due to COVID is trying to be particularly responsive and sensitive to the needs of our business community, and to do that, we wanted to be flexible around uh, the idea of parklets. And so, for for those who are not aware, a parklet is um, using a uh, parking space on the street for, uh, it could be a public parklet in which it's just a uh, sitting area space and maybe some plants or maybe some shade, uh, it, but it could also be a, a private parklet, which is to say that that business pays the city for the parking and uh, is able to, um, if it's a restaurant, be able to serve people out on the parklet. Uh, we, we also envisioned you know, if, a, if a retail shop wanted to spill out into a parking space in front of their shop, they could do that as well. Um, but especially as parking is free right now, it doesn't make sense to have people, uh, to have businesses be charged <laughs> for the use of the parking space. A good so, example. I think it's easiest if you give examples. Sure, uh, sure. There's one in front of Jay Morgan's and there's one in front of Positive Pie. Yes. The, you know. Yes, exactly. And there was one in front of Down Home last right, year. Which moved over to Jay Exactly, Morgan. right. right. So um, with all of that, uh, we wanted to make the opportunity for parklets more accessible to businesses. And You were also encouraging them to move onto the sidewalk in front of their yes, shops as well. Yes, yes. We wanted to, um, you know, in as far as uh, it was not encroaching on the, the lane of pedestrians, I suppose, uh, that we wanted to make sure that that was uh, clear, that businesses, retail um, shops could use some of the sidewalk space as well. Uh, so, and actually, as I hear, uh, apparently we have two applications already from businesses for some new parklets, which is exactly why we revised the parklet ordinance. So that was very encouraging. And, uh, you know, hopefully there will be more even. Was it, what was behind the city council's decision? Was the city council forced by the state to, to require masks. this before we, I go into my wife's store? <laughs> Fair enough, right. Uh, we were not forced to require masks. In fact, there are places that are not requiring, there are municipalities that are not requiring masks in businesses. But the governor did say that uh, municipalities could make that decision for themselves. And not to get too... Uh, technical or legal, but I, I, I always think it's kind of interesting that uh, Vermont is a state where municipalities only have the right to create ordinances um, for which they are expressly given permission to create um, those ordinances. So, you know, we, we can't regulate things that we're not expressly told that we're allowed to regulate. So uh, it's basically the governor's... Um, statement that uh, said that we are allowed to make this provision that that gave us the authority to do that and so we as a council heard from the business community that they, many of which were already requiring exactly they they were exactly many were already requiring masks as people came into their stores but we heard from them that they wanted the backup of having it as a requirement from the city and you know we we agreed we see we understand that you know it's a, a public health 
issue. And so we went ahead and said uh, that anyone going into a, bus into a public establishment, a public business, uh, would be required to wear a mask uh, as long as there, there are medical exceptions, and that's fine. And also, um, uh, they're required to wear masks to the extent that it does not interfere with the primary purpose of the business, which is to say that if it's a restaurant, you're allowed to not wear a mask while you eat uh, or drink. And uh, if it's a, you know, a salon, uh, you're certainly not required to wear a mask as you're getting a beard trimming or, you know, to, to have cuts like around your ears, that kind of thing. So uh, I, th I think it ultimately it was a very reasonable uh, ordinance or yeah. uh, emergency order, technically. I feel like I spent half this show plugging my other shows. We had <laughs> Carolyn Brennan from uh, the Cullig Hubbard. They're going to be requiring masks. Oh, are they're they? They're staying in conformity with the rest of I the city. I think that makes sense. When can I wear a mask into City Hall? Oh, well, that is a good question. Um, I, I think we are uh, starting to open up, and so we're, part of that is figuring out the bathroom situation. What um, is the bathroom situation? I, I, Carolyn speaks of that at Kellogg Hubbard. Yeah, so not all of the bathrooms will be open in City Hall Um it's, and I, I, uh, I think it's just the, the bathrooms on the lower level. And at Kellogg Hubbard, they're puzzling through how to keep these things sanitized, how often to yes, keep. Yes. They're still pondering how to, how right. to make that happen. Yeah, yeah. I imagine Bill and you are. Oh, are yeah. Doing well, and not, not me particularly necessarily. That's, that's sort of a, that's, a, that's Bill's domain. But um, yeah, but that is absolutely part of the question of reopening. Of which John Odom will be speaking of how do we vote in yes. August if City Hall hasn't reached that point. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I have been, as I've learned more about mail-in voting, I, I am increasingly intrigued by that. And, you know, we'll see if we have solely mail-in voting or whether we have some kind of hybrid. Um, we'll see. But I, I think it's, I've been really interested in seeing that the turnout, the response has been so much greater when you just have a system that automatically mails ballots to uh, folks that are registered. Your mayor's hours. We spent so many time, <laughs> so much time in February speaking about. You were so proud of your little office that I, they gave you. I was, and I was, and I was holding office hours, and there would be people that showed up to it. And of course, that came to a very abrupt stop when uh, everything started to close because of COVID. And we're not, we're still not meeting in person uh, as a council. And even as our committees start to reconvene, uh, we, we were asking our committees to, to not and meet. And commissions. And commissions, yep, to, um, with a few exceptions. But generally speaking, they were not meeting uh, because particularly because of uh, trying to lighten the workload for our um, staff that were not furloughed because uh, they were t taking on so much work of the, the folks who were out. And so just to lessen that, we asked well, many of our uh, committees and boards and, and commissions to not meet. But uh, with the new fiscal year that is, that's now available, but we are still asking them to meet remotely Which as is the no, council I've... is also doing. Uh, again, in the session we had with Dan Groberg from Montpelier Live, another plug, um, he spoke of being Zoomed out, <laughs> of the number of meetings every day that he does on Zoom. Yeah. Is that consuming you? Uh, yeah. I spend a significant time uh, of almost every day on Zoom. I, I suppose it's less now that school is out, but... Uh, but it's still still pretty real. <laughs> That's still a thing. I found that um, I found like the highest part of my kitchen to place my laptop on that, so I could stand during um, some Zoom meetings. So that's worked out well for me. Um, I find that I, I sometimes need to just move around a little bit, uh, just to, even to um, keep my my body like just to keep up my blood flowing and and to stay present. Uh, it's really important. <laughs> In terms of, of after the election, the city council holds a retreat where they set the new council priorities for the year yes. and all. This retreat happened right before the city shut down. It's true. And we set our priorities and goals for the year pre-COVID, right. really. How has that changed? 
What, which of those goals is yeah, really was having difficulty? I'm trying to remember if it was pre-COVID. If it, if it weren't, then it, it was very early in the process. I, I was going to say, it must have been. That was too early. Though I think we did, uh, we, we were setting our goals amid COVID. And particularly the reason why I know that this is true is because we uh, had an entirely separate category for addressing the impacts of COVID. Like that was, that rose to the level of being its own um, the uh, part of the, like the largest heading. I mean, so we have um, large heading goals like community prosperity and uh, being an inclusive community and or inclu inclusive and, and equitable community. We have a, a goal that is environmental stewardship. And underneath that, we have a lot of some subcategories of um, specific actions that we would like or ways that we would like to um, manifest those big goals. And right along with environmental stewardship and um, equitable and, and inclusive community, we had uh, addressing the impacts of COVID-19. Uh, just to keep it really front and center that, it's, that it was that important. Um, so we figured even then that we, we knew then that there were going to be financial impacts and that those financial impacts would potentially affect how we were able to accomplish those goals and priorities. And so we knew that even then that we would have to revisit those and potentially tweak or adjust those goals in about six months. So that's, that's part of our plan. Just two more questions. You have almost a half of your council that are new. Gosh, that is... Um, Two in district, uh, three. Yeah, yeah. So Dan Richardson is relatively new. Jay Erickson is relatively new. In district um, one, didn't we pick up? And just well, so Lauren. Yeah, I mean Lauren's right, um, relatively new. Rel well. Yeah, she's been on longer than Dan and Jay, but uh, I, yeah, yeah. What's it like to have so many new people on council? Uh, well, um, I mean, I, I guess. I would say, generally speaking, I have a lot of respect for, not, not even generally speaking, I have a lot of respect for, for all of uh, our, our council. Uh, I think they are um, uh, reasonable folks willing to hear people that have di uh, differing opinions, and uh, they've come to council prepared, and I think it's actually healthy to have um, some fresh eyes on old topics. I mean, I think there's also value to have uh, to having some institutional knowledge to say, oh yeah, I remember, I remember when that happened, and you know, here's the history of of, of that topic. And I know Jim Sheridan. Yeah, yeah. right, sure. Uh, but at the same time, I, it's good to have some fresh perspective. So I, I think it's actually a really nice balance right now. Of I, I'm actually I'm actually the longest serving member of the council. Uh, which is sort of shocking to me. I'm, uh, I'm the longest currently serving uh, member of, of the council. Um, and, and, you know, and that, that sort of helps just knowing, uh, because part of my job is just knowing how to navigate um, procedure. And so having had a fair bit of experience in terms of seeing how different types of situations played out and knowing how to, uh, what our role is as the city, uh, I think has been helpful. As people who've watched this show know, uh, my wife has a downtown store. How do you get people downtown? How do you reestablish this sense of community? Again, in the show with Carolyn from the library, we were talking about the library as a social hub of our yeah. community, an yeah. important social hub. Right. How do you reestablish that sense of community when our social hubs are not social hubs anymore? Well, that's a great question. Um, I was recently reading an update from our from the Montpelier Lives um, recovery uh, navigator, um, Jean. I think I'm Kiss, Kiss, Kissner. Kissner. Yes, Kissner. yes. Um, who I thought had some really excellent insight into that, which is to say that there are members of our community that feel that. That feel safe coming to down, to, you know, coming to our downtown as it is, and there are uh, members of our community who are um, 
hesitant, but willing to engage on a very limited level. And then there are folks that may, they just may not uh, engage with, with the community until there's a vaccine. And so I think it really comes down to uh, our, how safe it is and our sense of safety uh, with our downtown. And to be fair, I think having the mask ordinance is, or ordinance, uh, emergency order is important for that to help people feel safe and to, and to be safe uh, as they come downtown. Again, that's tricky because we know that part of that safety is still maintaining distance. And so that means that we, it, it's really hard to have a festival. I mean, this is why we canceled July 3rd. So, I mean, one of the things that I think we all love about downtown is, is having it feel like it's bustling and having it feel like it's, uh, you know, there's, there are things happening and there are events. Well, and we do have the farmer's market back up. We do have the farmer's market, yes. Uh, but it just, it, everything looks different now because... Everything feels different. Everything feels different because we have to stay distant. And so as, as Vermont and Montpelier uh, continue to um, go through the, through the, I was to say, like the, the health recovery that um, as, you know, with COVID, like as we continue to be safer, I think people will start to emerge and especially once there's a vaccine, but we may not have big festivals until that exists. But our next exists. big step will be eating in restaurants downtown and drinking. Yes, well, and now people now can uh, eat and drink at restaurants if they, uh, you know, there's limited uh, capacity at the restaurants, so that's, that's encouraging, and I know some folks are starting to uh, take restaurants up on that offer, and uh, some restaurants and uh, places are, are still continuing to have online uh, shopping experiences and online ordering uh, food experiences, and you know, certainly hope that people take advantage of that uh, as we try to make it through this time. So there are we you are. in constant contact with um, the state? Uh, or is that going through Bill? It, so it does go through Bill, but he, he sends out all of the updates to the council so that we are uh, kept abreast of all of the developments. Yeah. And city council still is picking up interest of people to um, sit and comment on, on your work. Oh, yes. Yeah, no, we certainly have um, lots How of folks. How do people avail themselves of council? Well, so we are still available by email, of course. That's, and that's fine. The emails are found on the website. Yep, all the emails are available on the website. And beyond that, uh, I would actually say, it's, uh, well, I, I would say that uh, the volume of public comments that we have had at our Zoom council meetings is more than we would typically get in an in-person meeting. Now, to be fair, that could be an artifact, not an artifact, a, um, a function of the national dialogue around race. And, you know, maybe we would be seeing increased numbers at an in-person council meeting uh, anyway, but it's tough to say. But I, I would say so far, there have been a lot of participants, and I, I think that's great. Are you hopeful? Generally speaking? Is our town going to weather through this? I think we are. I think we are. I think we're going to get through this. I think our downtown may look different. Uh, I, I think a lot of our businesses are uh, going to make it through. Maybe not everyone, but, uh, but we also have sort of a regular turnover anyway of businesses. Do you think we're going to see tourists for leaf season? I think we will see... Um, maybe not as many, but I think we, we still will. I actually had a friend of mine from college who lives in Pennsylvania say, you know what, all my kids' summer camps have been canceled, and so we are going on a road trip, and we want to come to Vermont. Where, where can we go in, in Vermont? And so, of course, you know. Can I make a suggestion? Sure. Montpelier. <laughs> exactly, right. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I think it may, it may just look different. Um, so we'll, we'll see how it goes. Mayor, thank you so much for again appearing here. And might I say that when the town reaches another milestone in its opening, I would hope to have you back. Absolutely. Happy to, to be here. 
chatting with you and, uh, and with all the, the public as well.